Dear ISV members, colleagues and friends, International Society for Vaccines is happy to continue our virtual Congress series on COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, it is truly remarkable within six months from our last Congress, multiple producers already moved vaccine candidates to regulatory approval and large scale human population use. For today's Congress, only those with regulatory approvals are invited. Now, let me introduce my co-chair, Professor Linda Klavinsky from King's College at London, who is an ISV fellow and the current secretary of ISV. She will deliver the welcome address to all speakers and attendees. Linda, please. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. So on behalf of my fellow co-chairs and the entire board of the International Society of Vaccines, I'd like to warmly welcome you to today's ISV Virtual Congress on COVID-19 Vaccine Development. So this is the fourth of a, of a series of virtual conferences on COVID-19 vaccines that the ISV convened and is also this is the first in 2021. So we initiated these meetings back in June 2020 so as to provide a balanced update on progress and development of a safe and efficacious vaccine to control the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, and also to provide a forum for discussion by experts on the challenges that confront the COVID-19 vaccine development uh, process. So for your information, the recordings from these previous ISV virtual congresses are available on our YouTube channel. Just look out for International Society for Vaccines, or you can also find the link via our website, isvcongress.org. So all of you will be aware since last summer that there's been unprecedented progress with many different vaccine uh, platforms, both in the form of traditional approaches and also some of the newer vaccine technologies that have been, never been licensed before until recently that have been applied now to the development of COVID-19 vaccines. These have moved astonishingly quickly through the different phases of clinical development. A number of vaccine developers have now reported their interim phase three data in the last few weeks, and an increasing number of vaccine candidates have now been improved by the regulatory agencies, and these are being now ruled out, rolled out rather, for emergency use to the general public. So in this conference today, we'll be hearing about four of those vaccines. Two on adenoviral vectored uh, vaccines, and two mRNA-based vaccines from the key scientists who have been at the heart of the development of these vaccines, both leading and inspiring their respective teams. Additionally, in the final session, we're pleased to have a presentation from Dr. Tom Chimakaburu from the US CDC, who will address the important topic of post-authorization safety surveillance. So please do stay on for this. So we're delighted that over 2,400 delegates have registered from across the globe for this uh, meeting today. We appreciate that time zone differences makes finding an optimal time for these events tricky. But we found last year uh, that the early morning start on the west coast of the Americas and the nighttime start in Southeast Asia and Austral Australasia is an acceptable compromise for everyone. And in any event, a recording will be available if you miss any part of the event, and we should be uploading that in the next couple of days. We've kept the duration of each Congress down to about two and a half hours, as we appreciate how busy everyone is. But we feel that this time of two and a half hours is just enough to give bite-sized chunks of the most important developments in the field. So with that in mind, can I remind today's chairs and speakers to please keep to your time allocation so that we can take a few questions at the end of each presentation. And delegates, do please uh, submit your questions for the presenters via the live session chat box facilities. So now let me move on now to introduce the first session that is on adenoviral vectored vaccines for COVID-19. So over the last 20 to 25 years, replication defective adenoviral vectors have transitioned from tools, from tools for gene therapy to bona fide vaccine delivery vehicles, receiving regulatory approval 
for, for use for the first time last year with the advected Ebola vaccines and more recently for SARS-CoV-2. Due to high population seroprevalence against these, the more commonly encountered human adenovirus serotypes, such as AD5, different strategies have been employed by vaccine developers that still retain and exploit the biochemical and immunological attributes of the adenoviral viruses as vaccine delivery vehicles, but circumvent pre-existing anti-ad immunity. So our speakers today have taken two different approaches. The first presentation from the Gamalea Institute combines an AD26 vector of low seroprevalence in the human population with an AD5 vector boost. And then the second presentation from the University of Oxford, partnered with AstraZeneca, has taken a slightly different approach, using a non-human non primate adenoviral vector for the first and second dose. So it's a real pleasure for me now to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ina Dolzikova, from the Gamalea National Research Center for Epidemiology and Microbiology in Moscow. So Dr. Dolzikova is head of the Russian State Virus Collection Laboratory, and this is a major virology resource for fundamental virus research and biotechnological developments. Her main research interest is in the development of viral vectored and subunit vaccines, and also in evaluating their immunogenicity post-vaccination. Since 2012, she has worked on the development of MERS, NASA, and pan vaccines. And more recently, her colleagues have, with her colleagues, she's contributed to the successful development of a COVID-19 and Ebola vaccine, which have been registered for medical use. So welcome, Dr. Dolzikova. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good day. Uh, first, we would like to thank the organizers uh, of the Congress for the opportunity to tell about our work. It is a great honor for us to speak a, at the ISV Congress. Our report will be devoted to the development and research of our vaccine Sputnik V. Next slide, please. In modern history, mankind has faced a coronavirus infections of uh, this magnitude for the first time. As of February 10, uh, the pandemic affected more than 200 countries, and the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases exceeded uh, 100 million people. More than 2 million people died. A set of measures is being taken everywhere to prevent a global catastrophe. Vaccination is one of the most effective ways to combat epidemics and pandemics. A lot of work is going on in different countries to develop and research vaccines against COVID-19. To date, according to the WHO, more than 170 candidate vaccines are at the stage of preclinical studies. More than uh, 60 vaccines are at different stages of clinical studies, of which 16 are already in the phase three. Next slide, please. When we started our work, we realized that the most promising antigen for inclusion in the vaccine was the SARS-CoV-2 glycoprotein S. This protein is required for virus to enter the cell. It interacts with the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface, which leads to its internalization. Having chosen the antigen, it was necessary to choose a technological platform for antigen delivery. Uh, the important things were that the vaccine should induce a balanced immune response and also form a protective response in a short time. The most promising candidates were viral vectors due to their ability to induce cellular and humoral immune response and form protective immunity after one or two immunizations. The most appropriate vectors in this regards were vectors based on uh, recombinant human adenoviruses. Adenoviruses live with humans for several million years, during which they have learned how to effectively transduce our cells. Vectors based on recombinant adenoviruses are replication defective and cannot cause disease in humans. Such vectors effectively penetrate cells, which results in the formation of a balanced immune response to the target antigen. Thus, a recombinant adenoviral vector platform was chosen for delivery of the target gene. An important feature of the Sputnik V vaccine is that it is based on the heterologous prime boost vaccination approach. Next slide, please. 
For the formation of a robust and long-lasting immune response, it is necessary to carry out double vaccination. But in case of immunization with adenovir uh, viral vector, the immune response develops not only to the target antigen, but also to the vector components. This anti-vector immunity can, res uh, can reduce the effectiveness of second immunization with the same vector. Using a different vector for secondary immunization allows to overcome the possible negative effect of anti-vector immunity after the first immunization. Thus, our vaccine was based on the approach of heterologous vaccination and the use of recombinant adenoviral vectors. Next slide, please. The vaccine has two components. Component one is a vector based on recombinant human adenovirus serotype 26, and component two is a vector based on a recombinant human adenovirus serotype 5. Both vectors carry the gene for the full end as glycoprotein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The components are administered consequently at intervals of 21 days. Initially, the vaccine was developed in two forms, liquid, uh, which is stored at uh, minus 80 degrees, uh, and lyophilized, which is stored at plus 4 degrees. However, the stability studies have been conducted, and we now know that the liquid form of the vaccine can also be stored at plus 4 degrees, which allows for easy logistics around the world. Next slide, please. First, preclinical studies of safety, immunogenicity and protection were carried out, and today I would like to focus on studies of protection in lethal models. When we started, uh, we didn't have a lethal model. At that time, transgenic mice were not yet available, and we developed a lethal model of SARS-CoV-2 infection in serious, uh, Syrian hamsters with induced immunosuppression. The animals were vaccinated with an interval of 21 days. Then, on the third day after boosting immunization, the animals were given immunosuppressants. We used dexamethasone and cyclophosphamide. Uh, one week later, the animals were challenged internasally with the SARS-CoV-2 virus at a dose of uh, 10 in the power of 6 uh, TCID-15. Uh, all animals in the vaccine group survived after the challenge, while the animals of the control group all died. On the day 8 after the challenge, we analyzed lung damages and viral load in several animals from each group and saw that multiple lesions were observed in the lungs of infected control animals. The viral load was more than uh, 10 in the power of 6 TCD-15. At the same time, the lungs of vaccinated infected animals showed no signs of damage. The virus was not detected in them. Uh, the second level model we used was uh, ACE2 transgenic mice from Jackson Laboratory. Mice were vaccinated twice uh, with a 21 days interval and a week after the second vaccination, the animals were infected intranasally. The survival rate of the vaccinated animals was 100% while all control animals died. On the days 4 and 7 after challenge, the viral load in the lungs was analyzed. The virus was detected in a high titer in control animals on the both days after challenge, while the virus was not detected in the lungs of vaccinated animals. Based on the results of preclinical studies, which showed, uh, which showed uh, high efficacy, immunogenicity and safety, we received permission to conduct clinical trials. Next slide, please. We studied both vaccine forms, liquid and lyophilized. The studies was, uh, were divided into two stages. A total of 76 volunteers took part in the studies. At the first stage, uh, each study uh, uh, was the study of safety and immunogenicity of individual components of the vaccine. Uh, and uh, nine volunteers were included in each study group. 
Based on the results of interim safety report, we received permission to launch the second phase. As a part of the st uh, second stage, uh, the safety and immunogenicity of the vaccine was investigated. The volunteers were administered with both components of the vaccine with an interval of 21 days. Each group consisted of 20 volunteers, so in total, 40 volunteers received both components. Next slide, please. When studying the safety of both individual components of the vaccine and of combined use uh, with an interval of 21 days, we show that the most common adverse events were hyperthermia, headache, asthenia, muscle and joint pain, changes in laboratory parameters, and pain at the, at the injection site. Most of the adverse events were mild. It is important to know that no serious adverse events were reported during the study. Thus, we have shown that the vaccine has a good safety profile and doesn't cause serious adverse events. Next slide, please. Immunogenicity studies have shown that the vaccine allows the formation of humoral and cellular immune response. So, when studying antigen-specific antibodies, all volunteers had antibodies by day 21 uh, after the first dose. When studying the neutralizing antibodies, all volunteers had antibodies by day 42 after the first dose. The study of cellular immune response showed that the vaccine allows the formation of an antigen-specific cellular immune response. Next slide, please. According to the results of the studies, the vaccine was provisionally approved on August 11 of 2020. Provisional registration requires a large-scale study, but also it allows the introduction of the vaccine for use among the population under strict pharmacovigilance. We are currently in the phase three clinical trials, trials of our vaccine. In order to monitor the safety and quality of the drug, which is used both in clinical trials of phase three and in clinical practice, the digital counter was created. The digital counter includes a register of all vaccinated in the unified state health information system, a system for monitoring of the movement of each vaccine dose, and a system for collecting information about side effects, a self-observation diary available for filling out to vaccinated persons through a special developed mobile application. Next slide, please. And today we are pleased to share the interim results of phase three clinical trials of our vaccine. The study is randomized, double blind and placebo controlled. At the time of the interim analysis, uh, 21,977 volunteers were enrolled and randomized in the study. The distribution of volunteers into vaccine and placebo groups is carried out in a proportion of 3 to 1. An interim analysis was made based on the achievement of a control point of 78 cases of confirmed COVID-19 in volunteers who received both doses of vaccine or placebo. Uh, the first volunteer in the study was vaccinated on September 9. Uh, in the research process, we analyze the following parameters. The primary outcome is the proportion of uh, participants with confirmed COVID-19 from day 21 after receiving the first dose. The secondary outcomes are severity of COVID-19 course, changes in uh, glycoprotein-specific antibody levels, changes in uh, neutralizing antibody levels, changes in antigen-specific cellular immune response, and incidence and severity of adverse events. Next slide, please. An interim analysis of almost uh, 20,000 volunteers who received both doses showed that the vaccine efficacy was 91.6% in preventing symptomatic COVID-19. Thus, in the vaccine group, 16 cases of COVID-19 were registered among almost 15,000 volunteers. The incidence during the analysis period was 0.1%. Uh, 
At the same time, in the placebo group, 62 cases of COVID-19 were registered among almost 5,000 volunteers. The incidence over the analysis period was 1.3%. Thus, the, uh, the vaccine has shown high epidemiological efficacy. It prevents the disease in more than 90% of cases. I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that the vaccine provides full protection against moderate and severe cases of COVID-19. So in the group of vaccinated who received both doses, uh, not a single case of moderate or severe COVID-19 uh, was recorded, while in the placebo group reported 20 such cases. Notably, in the vaccine group, most cases of COVID-19 occurred before the dose 2, before 21 days after the first dose. Rates of disease and set uh, were similar to the vaccine and placebo groups until about 16-18 days after the dose 1, after which early onset of protection led to much more slowly increase of number of cases in the vaccine group comparing the placebo group. Next slide, please. As a part of the study, an analysis of immunogenicity is carried out. We analyze the formation of both antibody and cellular immune responses. We study the IgG response in 456 volunteers. Overall, 98% of volunteers in the vaccine group had antibodies detected on day 42 after the first dose. Also, we show that the level of antibodies in volunteers of different age groups over 30 years old doesn't differ significantly. At the same time, the level of antibodies in the 18-30 year old group was higher. We conducted a study of neutralizing antibodies in 100 volunteers and neutralizing antibodies were detected in 96% of the vaccinated volunteers. It is important to note that when analyzing the antibody response, no difference was found between men and women. Uh, the analysis of the cellular immune response was carried out for 58 volunteers. Uh, the analysis of, uh, was based on determination of interferon gamma secretion by, uh, by uh, PBMC and glycoprotein specific secretion uh, was detected in all volunteers in the vaccine group. Their findings are consistent with uh, what we observed during the clinical trials phase 1-2. Thus, it has been shown that the vaccine forms a humoral and cellular immune response in volunteers. Next slide, please. The safety study of serious adverse events included more than uh, 20,000 volunteers who received at least one dose of vaccine or placebo. During this study, 70 episodes of serious adverse events were recorded, none of which was associated with the vaccination. The general safety study included more than 12,000 volunteers who received two doses, and the most common adverse events were flu-like illness, local reactions, headache, and asthenia. Most post-vaccinal systemic and local reactions were mild. Safety analysis in the 60-plus group show that the vaccine is generally easier to tolerate by uh, older volunteers. The frequency of adverse events in the 60-plus group was generally lower than in the 1860 groups. The results are also consistent with what we have observed in the phase 1-2 clinical trials. Next slide, please. So, interim analysis of the phase 3 trial showed that vaccine is effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 cases with the efficacy of 91.6% after day 21 from the first dose. Vaccine induces robust humoral and cellular immune response and the vaccine has a good tolerability profile. The vaccine has already been released in Russia for use by the public and as of today, more than 6 million doses of vaccine have already been administered to the public. Currently, clinical trials of the vaccine are ongoing in uh, five countries, including Russia, Belarus, India, UAE and Venezuela. And today the vaccine is registered in 20, uh, 23 countries uh, presented below. Next slide, please. 
We would like to thank uh, our uh, study participants, uh, site research staff and members of the trial management groups, uh, trial steering committee and IDMC. And uh, in the end, I would like to say that I'm not a native speaker and if possible, I will use the help of the interpreter for question section. Thanks for your attention. So thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Olsakova for a very interesting and a very clear talk and congratulations on your study. So we've had quite a lot of questions coming through the um, chat box whilst you were speaking. So let me kick off with some of these questions. So the first question is, can you tell us in a little more detail about the design of your SARS-CoV-2 spike gene that was expressed from your advected vaccine? Were any modifications made to the full length natural sequence, for example, either to stabilize the expressed protein or to increase expression? Thanks for your question. And uh, we didn't uh, make any modification to the protein. OK, so another question that's come through is um, regarding the lyophilized vaccine, which looks really exciting that because um, this is a, really an attribute for vaccine distribution that the data showed that there was little difference between the frozen vaccine formulation and the lyophilized. Can you tell us a little bit about what formulation was used to preserve the, the virus from the stresses of freeze drying in the lyophilized um, formulation? Hello? Uh, I'm very sorry, but I will uh, uh, reply in Russian and my helper will translate, okay? Okay. Мы использовали определенный состав буфера солевой, который позволил нам добиться таких хороших результатов. Но этот буфер является нашим ноу-хау. Actually, we used uh, a saline buffer and buffer solution, and uh, we designed a particular composition of that uh, saline buffer solution. But this is our know-how. Oh, okay. So um, you haven't revealed wh whether a disaccharides or something special or sugar alcohols were included. То есть вы uh, нигде не описываете, включали ли вы, например, uh, сахар, спирты, какие-то еще компоненты для того, чтобы обеспечить стабильность вируса при лиофилизации? Мы это описываем, и да, действительно, помимо солей мы используем сахарозу и uh, незначительное количество этанола. Well, actually, there is a description on that, and uh, indeed, in addition to salt, we do use some sucrose as well as some ethanol. So, regard, relating to some of the questions from the uh, from the actual data slides, one question is: What was the vaccine dose that was delivered in the hamster efficacy study? What was the vaccine dose? The vaccine dose was uh, 10 in the power of 8 viral particles of uh, both adenoviruses. OK, uh, another question is um, how many people from Annie de Groot, how many people in the phase one and phase two, how many people were there in the phase one and phase two safety study? How many people were enrolled in the safety, the early safety study? Uh, in the clinical trial of phase one, two, total number of volunteers was uh, 76. OK. And then another question is, in the phase three study, was PCR, PCR testing routine for all subjects or only if the subject had symptoms? And might this undercount the number of asymptomatic infections. So did you do PCR testing on all the participants in the phase three or only once they showed symptoms? Uh, we did PCR test at the screening and uh, at the day of administration of uh, those two. So on day 21. And then we were not doing uh, routine PCR tests, but uh, we did it only if the volunteer had uh, sites of respiratory infection. 
and yes, we understand that uh, we could miss some cases of asymptomatic uh, COVID-19. But uh, in the future, we are planning to analyze uh, antibodies to nucleocapsid protein of SARS-CoV-2 volunteers in order to detect asymptomatic cases of COVID-19. And uh, we will do it in uh, this uh, phase three study. And there's been a lot of, of information about now about the circulation of new viral variants. How do these new variants of SARS-CoV-2 impact the findings of your efficacy study? And are you planning new, new trials in other areas where there may be these variants circulating? Uh, we are planning to determine uh, to uh, study the cross reactive and uh, cross uh, protection studies of uh, immune response after our vaccine to the new variants of uh, SARS CoV 2 virus and uh, about uh, clinical trials in different regions uh, where the new variants is uh, uh, present. We will think about it. Right. And um, in your phase one study that was reported in The Lancet, some of the participants had pre-existing anti-vector neutralizing antibodies to add five or also anti to add 26. And it, you showed that there was an expansion after vaccination of the add five specific antibodies, implying that obviously the, the B cells to the add five were expanding. So can you tell us what about what happened after vaccination to the ad specific CD4 T cells? So the question really that was being asked is what is the effect of vaccination on the ad5 CD4 T cell response of ad zero for ad5 zero positive participants? Because this is important as you'll be aware that it was reported over 10 years ago that there was a, an increased risk of HIV infection in men who were ad 5 positive and then were vaccinated with a recombinant ad 5 vectored vaccine in the STEP and FAMBILI trials. So uh, in our first uh, one, two clinical trial, we analyzed uh, only antibody response uh, to the vector components, but we didn't analyze cellular response to the vector. OK, and is that something that you might be planning just to look on a safety basis going forward? And it is an interesting question, and uh, I think that we should think about it and plan these studies. And are, is there a potential risk or, or are you planning in the future to look at different areas of the world where this fire, the, the, where there are higher rates of possibly HIV of HIV, or are you, would you are you planning to avoid delivering your vaccine in those areas of the world? I think we might have lost the speaker. So perhaps we should move on then. Uh, are you still there, Dr. Dolcikova? Well, perhaps I should then thank Dr. Dolcikova and we should perhaps move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, oh, she's still there. Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry. Some I problem with connection, maybe. And uh, I will uh, answer in Russian and my helper will translate. Thank you. Uh, в настоящее время нет публикаций, uh, связывающих достоверное uh, влияние наличия инфекции, наличную ну, иммунизации на дальнейшее проявление инфе инфекции. Пока мы этого еще не изучали. Well, uh, as of today, there are no publications that would link uh, uh, these uh, immunization with some long term consequences in terms of HIV. So we haven't started that yet. Good. OK, thank you very much. So 
thank you again for your presentation and for taking all these questions. But for the sake of time, I think we need to move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Dulcikova, for joining us today. And I hope okay. you'll listen for the rest of the conference. Okay. So let me now move on and introduce our next speaker. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Sarah Gilbert from the Jenner Institute in Oxford and to welcome her back to update us on the astonishing progress her team and collaborators have made since the summer when she last spoke at our very first ISV COVID-19 um, vaccine congress. So there can be actually very few people who've not actually heard of Dr. Uh, Professor Sarah Gilbert and her team, so I'm going to be really brief. So Sarah is Professor of Vaccinology at the University of Oxford and leads the Jenner Institute's Vaccine Research Programme on many emerging pathogens, including MERS, Lassa, Nipah and influenza virus, where she's taken candidate vaccines from the design concept right through to clinical development and upscaling manufacture using the chimp chimpanzee adenovirus vectored vaccine approach. In the last year, her, she has turned her focus to SARS-CoV-2 with spectacular success. And she's also, I should mention, the Oxford Project lead for the Chadox NCOV-19 vaccine that has received regulatory approval and has been rolled out in many different countries now. So over to you, uh, Sarah, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Linda, for that kind introduction. So could we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the next one, please. Thank you. So I don't think I really need to introduce replication deficient adenoviral vectors to any great extent uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're having a whole session on them and I'm sure everybody's very familiar with the technology by now. Just wanted to point out a few things that aren't always apparent to people. Um, firstly, that um, because the vaccine antigen is encoded in the viral genome, it is not a structural part of the adenovirus. So externally, the, the structure of the viral particle is unchanged. This means that it's a true platform technology and the adenovirus will behave the same whatever genetic cargo it's carrying. Um, and the antigen is only expressed once the cell, sorry, once the virus has infected a cell after vaccination. Now we use a very strong promoter to express the antigen and we've been able to show in some proteomics testing that in human cells transfected with chadox one and cov 19 uh, we 70% of the, of the novel protein that's being made in that cell is actually the spike protein. So we get a fairly low level expression of all of the different adenoviral proteins uh, and obviously no assembly of further variants. So no replication, no spread through the body. But the fact that we are getting a, a very transient infection of human cells in the context of a large amount of expression of a foreign protein is extremely powerful at inducing immune responses, which is clearly why we use this technology. Adenoviruses, as Linda said, originally looked at for um, for gene therapy applications, they turn out to be um, annoyingly too immunogenic for gene therapy applications, but they are very helpfully immunogenic for making vaccines. And we get strong B and T cell responses. Adding other adjuvants to adenoviruses is not only not necessary, it, it, it just doesn't, we haven't found an adjuvant we can add that improves the immune response. It's already engaging with the immune system in so many different ways um, that actually uh, there's no need for additional adjuvants and they, they don't seem to help at all. So Chanox-1 is something that's been in development in Oxford for many years. Prior to this, we'd worked with um, other partners who had simian adenoviral vector vaccines, notably CHAD-3, CHAD-63, um, in our vaccine development programmes in more on global health than on emerging pathogens at that time. And we wanted to have our own Oxford version of a simian adenoviral vector vaccine that we could put to whatever use we chose. And so that led us to um, develop Chadox-1, which came from a simian adenovirus, um, one that normally circulates among chimpanzees, uh, which was uh, known as Y25 and was isolated many years ago. Uh, and we were able to obtain some of the DNA and then generate from that the viral vector with the E1 and E3 deletion and modification to the E4 region, which helps with manufacturing yields. And we then have systems for slotting in whichever gene we want. And obviously in this case, um, the protein of use is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the name of the vaccine includes NCOV-19 because we started this well before the virus was actually named. It was the novel coronavirus 2019 at that point. And that once you name a, a vaccine for GMP production, it doesn't change the name until it gets licensed. Um, 
So we'd used Chadox-1 in a number of different phase one studies carrying different antigens. Uh, we'd vaccinated 330 different people with it, but in, more generally with simian adenovirus in trials, they've been tested in over 6,000 subjects prior to 2020, uh, and those included infants in Africa for malaria vaccine trials and with uh, Chalox-1 in my flu vaccine trials in the UK, people over the age of 70. And we'd seen a consistent safety profile and very strong immunogenicity after one dose. We'd also been working on the development of MERS vaccine, again, a, a coronavirus, uh, again, using the spike protein. We'd shown that by adding a TPA leader sequence at the end terminus of the protein, we got higher expression levels of the antigen, which led to higher immunogenicity in preclinical studies. And we continue to use that. Um, we showed that in a non-human primate challenge study, we got protection after a single dose and the MERS vaccine uh, has completed phase one trials in the UK and in Saudi Arabia with the expected safety and immunogenicity profile. During those studies, we tested different dose levels of the vaccine. We decided to go in our SARS-CoV-2 trials for the highest dose that we'd used in those studies. Knowing that it was somewhat reactogenic, but also slightly more immunogenic, than the, um, than the lower dose that had been used also in the MERS vaccine trial. Um, however, because there's a pandemic and we want to make sure that we can get the strongest immune response we can with one dose, we went for that higher dose. We also uh, originally conceived these trials as single dose trials. Um, it's not true that certain vaccines are developed as single dose and certain vaccines are developed as two dose uh, vaccines, but we, uh, discovered in our phase one study that when we gave a second dose of the same vaccine, we could increase significantly the neutralizing antibody titer that we got after immunization. And because um, we don't have, or we still don't have now, we certainly didn't have any idea then of correlates of protection uh, for humans uh, to be protected against coronavirus, we decided to go with the approach that would give us the strongest immune response possible. And so we added a second dose into our clinical studies at that point. But as you will see, um, not all of the people in the trials were boosted at the same um, interval, and that's led to some very interesting, intriguing data and actually a much greater knowledge of, um, of the use of the vaccine than we would have had had we done um, one very standard regimen across all of the trials. So if you'd have the next slide, please. So our phase one study began on the 23rd of April of last year in the UK, um, 18 to 55 year olds healthy population with 1,077 people recruited and randomized to receive either uh, the Chalix-1 vaccine or a meningitis vaccine in the control group. Now we are deliberately using another vaccine as a control because we want the subjects to truly remain blinded. So we want a vaccine that is going to induce some reactogenicity after vaccination. And you can see the reactogenicity um, in the middle of this slide. Um, and we are getting the expected profile of reactogenicity for a replication deficient adenoviral vectored vaccine. Most of the adverse events are mild, um, commonly pain at the injection site, headache, a feeling of feverishness and some fevers in, uh, for the systemic reactions. We showed that um, taking paracetamol prophylactically from the time of vaccination and over the next 24 hours could somewhat reduce the reactogenicity and had no impact on the immune response. So there's no problem with taking um, paracetamol for 24 hours. It will help with the side effects, which are more prominent in younger people, uh, but it doesn't have any impact on the immune response. And we saw after the first vaccination, um, you can see the neutralizing antibody response on the left. This is an IC80 assay, live newt assay. Uh, we are inducing neutralizing antibody titers with the first dose, giving a second dose four weeks later, those increase. Originally in this very small group in the phase one study, but we went on to look at that across the board in the later trials. And on the right hand side, you're looking at the T cell responses of the meningitis vaccine group in blue on the left, the um, the prime group in the middle um, showing that we get a very good, good induction of T cell responses measured by interfering gamma early spot from 14 days after the first vaccination. But this doesn't increase with a second vaccination. So we are seeing uh, a modulation of the immune response after the second vaccination compared to the first. That's maybe the first hint that when we do start to look at correlates of protection for many of these vaccines used as two doses, we may need to consider um, immune response after the first dose and again after the second dose 
depends whether we're asking what is the correlate that gives us rapid onset of immunity that may be very different from the correlate that gives us good durability of immunity many months after the vaccinations have been completed. Next slide please. We went on to a phase two study to expand the age range upwards and in this first uh, population we had 80 people between the ages of 56 and 69 and 120 of them over 70. These were healthy adults um, and in this small phase two study we saw that the reactionicity was lowered compared to the younger population but the immunogenicity and in particular the neutralizing antibodies was identical to the younger age group. When we went on into the phase three study, we then took um, a much wider range of the population. So the people that we were recruiting into phase three included those living with comorbidities such as obesity with a BMI greater than 30 and diabetes and some heart complaints or respiratory conditions. And in that population, on average, we saw a slight decline in the immune response in the older adults compared to the younger ones. That's not purely a symptom of age, though. It's, it's more of a function of the comorbidities because we don't see that even slight decline in healthy older adults. Next please. So the clinical development plan which began in April um, in Oxford then extended into the phase two and the phase three study across the UK with 20 different clinical trial sites and then working with partners in South Africa and Brazil and then in Kenya we extended those studies um, in order to have um, a larger number of people enrolled into our studies. So it's a phase one, two trial in South Africa with about 2000 people enrolled. The majority of the, the, the 2000 are HIV negative. There's also a group of 100 are HIV positive as a sub study. In Brazil, we have um, 10,000 people in, enrolled, randomized one to one in the phase three study and um, 12,000 in the phase two, three study in the UK. This vaccine was then licensed to AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca took on the um, large scale manufacturing of the vaccine and also began to uh, initiate their own clinical plans. So they have initiated a clinical study of 30,000 subjects in uh, mainly in the US, but with also some subjects in Chile, Peru and other countries. And um, the Serum Institute of India sub-licensed uh, the manufacturing um, technology from AstraZeneca. Uh, they are producing this vaccine now in very large amounts and I'll come back to that later, but they also conducted their own clinical studies in India. Um, AstraZeneca also has a phase one, two trial in Japan, which will help with um, attempts to license the vaccine in Japan and plans for studies in Russia and in other countries as well. Um, so we always planned to make a vaccine for the world within the university and that is it means it's really important to be testing the vaccine in different parts of the world so that we can see how it behaves in different populations. Um, and so even from our very early studies with the UK sponsored trials, we reached out to other groups to, to help us with this aim of testing the vaccine on multiple clinical trial sites. Next, please. We also need to think about um, manufacturing and supply, and this was done by rapidly setting up a network of vaccine manufacturers across the globe with distinct supply chains so that we can manufacture in different parts of the world in order to supply different parts of the world. Uh, and again, I'll come back to this later. Uh, next, please. So um, we were able to present our interim analysis uh, for the Oxford sponsored trials um, on the 23rd of November. Uh, the data cutoff date was the, for this was the 4th of November and it's important to remember that that's before we had many variants circulating within the trials uh, so there's more information to come later from these same trials um, but the data was locked DSMB reviewed 21st of November and we presented this on the 23rd. Next please. So from the safety of that combined analysis, we saw the expected reactogenicity um, and uh, adverse events were balanced between the active and control arms. There were um, across the trials, across all four studies, um, so that's two studies in the UK, the phase one, two and the phase two, three, the Brazil trial and the South Africa trial all were included in the safety analysis that's been presented to regulators. And we saw SAEs occurring in 168 participants with a total of 175 events. Of these, three were deemed possibly related to either the experimental or a control vaccine. Next, next slide, please. So those possibly vaccine related SAEs 
on one case of hemolytic anemia in the control group who received the meningitis vaccine, um, and that was 10 days after receiving that vaccine. One case of transverse myelitis um, 14 days after the booster dose of Tamax-1 NCOV-19, which was deemed possibly related to vaccination um, and then resolved. Uh, and one case of fever above 40 degrees in uh, one of the participants who remains blinded. We don't know which vaccine they received. Um, the fever subsided quickly and they weren't hospitalised. They then went on to receive a second dose of the, of the allocated vaccine as planned without a similar reaction. So next, please. The primary outcome endpoints are what we need to look at when we're going to determine um, our primary vaccine efficacy. And this for in our studies is symptomatic PCR positive COVID-19. Um, so PCR positive using a uh, PCR test, which we also have reports of the of the CT value for, um, and they need to have um, symptoms uh, which would include one of cough, shortness of breath, fever above 37.8, anosmia or agersia. And for the primary analysis, these are cases which occurred more than 15 days after the second dose of vaccine, although of course other analyses take other cases into account. And these needed to be in participants who were seronegative at baseline. We had previously included some seropositive individuals and shown that their antibody responses were boosted by vaccination. Those were not included in this primary analysis. They had to be without prior positive PCR results and more than 15 days follow up from the second dose. That meant that um, COV-01, the UK phase one study and COV-5, the South African study, were included from this initial analysis because they would contribute less than five cases each. They can be included in subsequent analysis if that number goes above five. Um, so the next slide, please. So this is then looking at the UK phase three and the Brazil trials. And if we look at hospitalisation and severe disease, um, hospitalisation with a WHO severity score of four or more, um, we see that less than 21 days after the first dose, we had two hospitalisations in the Chaddox-1 group. One was uh, actually um, infected on the day of vaccination and one was um, diagnosed 10 days after the first vaccination, whereas there were six in the controls. From um, 21 days after the first dose, there were no hospitalisations in the Chalux one group, but five in the control group. If we um, take a subset of that and look at the more severe cases with a severity score of six or more, we see no cases at all in the vaccinated group and one in the um, in the control group. So the endpoint that we're using is actually a very mild disease endpoint. Um, and it's important when comparing studies to think about the impact of that. We know that vaccines are more likely to protect against deaths and then severe disease. For COVID, um, severe disease is more severe than hospitalisation. And so we're getting complete protection against hospitalisation once we've given time for the immune response to kick in. But our endpoint is in mild COVID. So if we go to the next slide, please. This is the overall analysis of the um, the, the primary interim, sorry, the interim analysis after the second dose um, in all those who met the endpoints for primary analysis. So no hospitalizations, no severe cases and no deaths and overall a 70% efficacy. But there is more complexity in the data set than that when we start to look at different subsets in the population. So next slide, please. In the trial in the UK, we had some subjects who received a half dose of the vaccine as the first dose before receiving a full dose, um, and the remainder had two full doses, and the intervals between doses were also different. In Brazil, uh, the interval between doses was a very standard four weeks, whereas in the UK, particularly in the low dose, standard dose group, the interval tended to be much longer, and I'll come on to that um, in the subsequent slides. But what we saw in this initial breakdown was that those who received a half dose before a full dose had 90% vaccine efficacy, whereas those in the UK receiving a standard dose twice um, had 60% vaccine efficacy. And then when we include Brazil um, and look at the overall analysis, the, the, the mean efficacy comes out to be, or sorry, the pooled efficacy is 70.4%. But that um, is probably oversimplifying matters. So next slide, please. So the marketing authorization application was for two standard doses with protection from 21 days after the first dose, 
no hospitalizations or severe days, disease from 21 days after the first dose. The two doses to be given with an interval of four to 12 weeks, and we already had data to indicate that the longer interval between the two doses may induce better efficacy. And we saw very similar results in those with comorbidities and in older adults. Next, please. So the UK approval was given in December and the UK um, policy was deemed to be that two doses would be given with a 12 week interval, so three months between the two doses. That was because the um, antibody response post boost is higher, two and a half to three times higher with um, a three month interval between the doses rather than a one month interval. And even in the interim analysis, there was a trend to higher efficacy with the second dose. We see protection of around 70% from three weeks after the first dose until the second dose is given. And that's the data that we had at the time of the interim analysis from the November the 4th cutoff date. Um, next, please. We were then able to provide an update with a further data cut from early December, and we were able to look at the efficacy after the single dose and the influence of timing of the booster dose, uh, which is important to support the UK vaccine policy which has been criticised, um, but actually now we have data to, to support its use, which is uh, even more convincing than it was at the time of the um, emergency use licensure. So um, we now have 332 cases of primary symptomatic COVID-19 to analyse, including um, efficacy estimates, including data from all four studies, so now including South Africa as well as Brazil and the UK. And these analyses showed that a higher vaccine efficacy was obtained with a longer interval between the first and second dose, and that a single dose of vaccine is highly efficacious in the first 90 days before the second dose is given. Next, please. So these are data tables taken from that analysis uh, where we're looking at the time from the first standard dose before the second dose is then given. Um, so the cutoff is either the, the time stated or when the second dose is given, whichever is the earlier. So uh, with an interval of um, 22 to 30 days we, after the first dose, we saw 77% vaccine efficacy, uh, which was the same uh, with an interval of 60 days or 90 days between the vaccine doses. Now, there's apparently a dip in vaccine efficacy when we go from 90 to 120 days. Is that, that's most likely um, a feature of having fewer cases to analyse. There's only 10 cases um, in that group. Uh, but actually, if we then look at the next month after that, the efficacy goes back up to 70% again. However, the recommendation is to give second vaccination at 84 days. So we only need to consider the efficacy in the um, up to the 61 to 90 days group and that has not decreased um, get, um, from the efficacy with the shorter um, time point. So overall between 22 and 90 days from the first dose we're seeing 76 percent vaccine efficacy so very high vaccine efficacy with a single dose. Next please. We then went on to look at the efficacy after the second dose uh, with different intervals between the first and the second dose. And here that you can see there is a trend towards increasing vaccine efficacy as that interval increases, again supporting the recommendation that there should be three months between the first and the second dose. Next, please. So, um, I'm going to ask you to, to click through again. It's much easier if I do this myself, but these are the, uh, if you could click on again, uh, these are the uh, licensed, um, the countries in which the vaccine has now been licensed, starting from with the UK on um, the 29th of December, um, continuing with either emergency use authorization or conditional authorization in many different countries. And I think if you click again and again, and again, um, and again. Uh, this goes up to the European authorization. Can we just go back one now to the European authorization on the 29th of January? Uh, subsequent that Vietnam uh, has licensed the vaccine, and we continue to work with regulators around the world to provide data uh, which will allow for the uh, addition of further countries to this list. It's currently at about 50 countries in total when we include all of the EU countries and we intend to increase that. Next, please. We have um, an established um, supply capacity with the aim of um, enabling broad and equitable access towards 3 billion doses by the end of 2021 for worldwide supply. 
Now, the manufacturing began in the UK in April of 2020, uh, where we established a manufacturing network of um, partners, some of whom uh, had experience in manufacturing adenoviral vectors uh, previously, but generally they didn't. But um, that was the first group of manufacturers to, to set up manufacturing. Um, sub license to the Serum Institute of India is very important. They will produce a very large number of doses for the COVAX facility, um, as well as for um, local supply. And we have other manufacturing partners which are working in different countries, again, with the aim of um, providing local supply. Um, in some cases, it's the full manufacturing. In some cases, it's fill and finish. Next, please. So I just want to finish by acknowledging particularly all of our clinical trial volunteers who are obviously crucial to, to the work that we do and the many, many people in the team um, and all of the trial site investigators and teams in the different countries who worked with us in this endeavour. And I'll stop there and um, take any questions that you might have. So, Sarah, thank you very much for a terrific talk. And we've had quite a few questions coming in as you were speaking. So um, the First one is actually, let me see, where is it? Yes, from your study, um, increasing the time interval uh, between the second of the second dose from less than six weeks to 12 weeks was associated with a substantial increase in vaccine efficacy against sy symptomatic COVID. So the question that came in was, is this beneficial effect associated with possible waning of immunity to the vector from the prime and thus potentially a better trans? Uh, transduction efficiency by the second dose. And linked to that, another question was, do you have data correlating anti-vector neutralizing antibodies and effect and the effectiveness of the boost? We do. That is published in the Lancet paper, Ramasami et al, the phase two study, and it shows that there is an induction of neutralizing antibodies against the vector with the first dose. But the level of that has no impact on the ability to boost with the second dose. It's actually quite low. Um, it declines quickly. It starts to decline from three weeks. Uh, when we track this over time, as we have done in other studies, we see those anti-CHAD neutralizing antibodies dropping off from three weeks after the first vaccination and no correlation between the level of neutralizing antibodies against the vector and the boosting ability of the second dose. And so another related question regarding this, you know, the the um, the, the, the delay the, the benefits of the delayed um, boost is whether the quality in terms of affinity and breadth of the anti-spike antibodies change by increasing the interval between the prime and the boost. So do you have any, do you have data uh, correlating effectiveness with affinity and breadth yet? <laughs> we, don't, we don't yet have a breakdown of the affinity and breadth with time after yeah. boosting. What we do have is um, uh, the magnitude of the neutralizing antibody response correlated with time after boosting and that is clearly two and a half to three times stronger with a long interval as, uh, as opposed to a short interval. We have published quite a lot of information on the uh, the more detailed analysis of the serological response um, showing the different antibody subclasses. We do induce IgA for example. Um, that breakdown hasn't been done with time after boost but it really seems to be just a larger effect when there's a longer interval between the time and boost. And I think it's much more to do with the immune system reaching a stage where it's ready to be boosted than any anti-vector immunity, which seems to have minimal effect. Oh, that's really interesting because from the HIV field, there was a lot of preoccupation, of course, with, uh, you know, a somatic hypermutation and, and a you know, a delay uh, of, of, of second doses, allowing that a sort of evolution of the antibody response. OK, let's move on then to another question. Um, which has come in regarding the ability of the vaccine, uh, which has shown to confer similar levels of protection against the B117 lineage and the Victoria lineage, despite a sevenfold lower capacity of sera from vaccinees to neutralize the, one, the B117 variants. And so what are the possibilities? And the question here was asked was, is it that possibly that the threshold of neutralizing antibodies required to be effective is actually lower than we originally anticipated? Or are there, or in addition, are there other immune mechanisms that may contribute to the protection from symptomatic infection? And do you have data to correlate the role for, role for other antibody functions? 
and other respective functions. OK, with... well, this yeah. relates again slightly to the last question as well. So the data that we have on neutralizing antibodies, unfortunately, we have a bottleneck in, in the regulatory compliant labs, the labs who can do the regulatory compliant assays that we need to generate the data to present to the regulators. So these are not just exploratory analyses. These are regulatory compliant um, analyses that must be done. Um, and that means that we can't test every single sample from every time point from every participant in the study. And uh, we have to prioritize which which data sets we are going to look at. So we haven't been able to look at the breadth um, of the um, neutralizing antibody response in different samples taken from different time points to come back to your previous case. We have looked at uh, in, in more exploratory immunology studies um, at the, the full range of antibody um, effects that we're getting from the vaccination. We're certainly seeing a lot of antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, other antibody um, uh, and cellular mediated functions. And of course, CD4 and CD8 T cell responses are being induced with this vaccine. So although I think overall what we're seeing from vaccines is, is kind of what's emerging as a correlative protection is a neutralizing antibody response, it's actually very much more complex than that. Uh, and I was saying before that I think correlates of protection early after vaccination, and we clearly do have early onset of protection, will turn out to be different from correlates of protection for durable immune responses. And that's something that we're going to need to work out how we study that, because one of the reasons for wanting to know a correlate of protection is thinking about when to boost a population, because we can track the immune responses um, if we know what the correlate is over time, and that helps us determine when we should be giving a boost. But that's not the whole story about the mechanism of protection, and it's probably a surrogate of a correlate, and I think there's an awful lot more to it than just the neutralizing antibody response. Certainly the breadth of the neutralizing antibody response is, is something to look into further. So. Um, it, it theoretically it could be either that the neutralizing antibody response is so high it can take a seven holes hit and still work but i think it's also partly to do with the fact that we have uh, many other uh, immune mediators involved that are contributing to that protection and teasing all of that out when we now have the situation with multiple different variants is going to be a very complex process so these variants are actually giving the opportunity to unravel some of these other mechanisms when the titers drop against the new variant Okay. Well, it's, that's a lovely glass half full um, attitude to the variants, Linda. I think that's the most positive attitude to the variants that I've heard so far. Um, uh, so far, we're, we're being plagued with the difficulty even to find out where the variants are because it depends on how much sequencing is being done in different countries, of course. So um, we have quite a lot of it in the UK, so we, we really know what we're dealing with. But in other countries where other trials are being run, it's not always clear which variants we are testing efficacy against. And I think that's a situation that's going to become complex for all of the vaccine developers. And um, there's an awful lot of work to be done on that. But I, I'm glad you see it as a positive thing. And actually, I'm going, there's been about 30 questions. I can't ask all of these, but one is related to that last question is, do you know how long the protein is expressed actually following vaccination? It, it, because presumably in the general centres, there may be anti, uh, antigens there for substantial period of time. The antigen expression, the period of producing the antigen is probably a matter of days. It's quite short. Um, the, the persistence of the antigen, the protein that's been made, uh, we don't really have any, um, we haven't studied that in any detail. We do have some lovely um, electron micrograph images of transfected cells showing that the, the surface of the transfected cell is entirely covered with um, the coronavirus spike proteins in the pre-fusion confirmation. So although there's a wild type sequence, the antigen that the immune system is seeing is pre-fusion spike being presented on the surface of the infected cell in very large amounts. And obviously some of that is then going to be picked up by antigen presenting cells and taken off to the lymph nodes and um, that will gradually be, be processed. But there is there is a large amount of it produced within a small area. So there may be some persistence of the protein for a while. So we one last question. I'm going to try and roll a number of questions on the, the future or future proofing uh, the vaccine. So one question was, um, do you foresee uh, mixing and matching, that's using very lay terms, um, different vaccine modalities or platforms? So taking the, the Chadox ad vector with maybe combining it with an mRNA or another ad vectored uh, platform? Absolutely. Of course, I've worked, as you know, I've worked on heterologous prime boost immunization for decades. Um, we have preclinical data showing that that's a very um, effective way 
uh, effective in terms of inducing very strong neutralizing antibody responses to go. It's something that's being formally studied in the UK now. There's a trial called ComCov that's kicked off. We, as the vaccines are, are licensed, so we have two vac licensed vaccines that are now in use, the Pfizer vaccine and this AstraZeneca vaccine, and those are included in a heterologous prime boost study. We would be interested to add more to that. Uh, it's being done as the vaccines are licensed. Uh, there are obviously very many different combinations that could be used, so we're narrowing it to the ones that actually might happen in the UK, partly to find, provide safety data. Um, I'm sure there will be no issue with that, but also to look at the opportunity for increasing immune responses with, with the mixing and matching approach. And with obviously SARS-CoV-2 uh, likely to remain endemic for years and new variants arising by mutation and immune selective pressure, how do you see the future proofing of the actual antigen design of the next generation of these vaccines? Do you think annual tweaks such as antigen swaps, which I understand you're already working on in terms of the what's called the South African variant, so that will akin to sort of a, the seasonal flu updates? Or do you think we need more radical plans, multivalent antigens, leveraging uh, sort of conserved sequences, thinking like, again, related to the HIV field of the mosaic vaccine approaches? And I know that I believe uh, Michelle Nussensweig and Pam Bjorkman have been looking at mosaic sequences for SARS-CoV-2 as well. So could you comment on that? Yes, yeah, certainly, as you say, we are preparing a number of different um, versions of the antigen to match different variants that are now circulating and, and becoming dominant in certain areas of the world. This is at work at risk. Again, we don't know which ones we need. If we need any of them, we're getting them already. We'll be taking them into clinical studies um, in the not too distant future and then making the decision. And the anticipated approach is going to be something very much akin to a strain change for flu, where the CMC package is the same. We simply have a different antigen in the vaccine. Uh, your question about using more sophisticated approaches, I think that that's very much a research activity for the moment. I think it should be a, you know, a lot of a collaborative research opportunity. I, I don't know that the vaccine is necessarily going to continue to adapt at the rate that it is doing now because it's in its first year or 18 months since moving from a different species into humans and it would you would expect it to adapt we don't know if it will continue to adapt at the same rate although of course it may do it's not mutating as fast as flu does um so it, i'm i'm not necessarily thinking we're going to have to have a, a a boost with a new variant vaccine every year we may need to do it at the end of this year um and then monitor the situation but obviously it's something we need to keep a very close eye on so could though our ideas of the rates of, of mutation or the variants be confounded by the problem of sort of um, immune selective pressure if there are low levels of antibodies around in certain individuals selecting and then out faster these more variants? Yes, yeah, so the, the thinking is that the, the B17, which has become dominant in the UK, is not um, really about evading immune selection, uh, immune pressure. It's to do with greater transmissibility, yes. whereas the B135 um, does appear to evade the um, immune response from the uh, infection with the first strain or the uh, vaccination against the first strain. Uh, it's all very recent and we're going to continue to monitor what happens. But of course, the, the virus has to infect cells. Its receptor binding domain, which is where we're seeing the majority of these mutations, has to be able to bind the ACE2 receptor and get that virus into a cell. And there, is, there are not endless possibilities for the virus to mutate away and still be able to maintain that with a high level of efficiency. So some mutations may evade the immune response, but actually make the virus less transmissible and will tend not to be to become fixed in the population. So I think it's going to be a scientifically very interesting situation and very necessary to keep tracking those mutations and have lots of sequencing done um, in many different countries so that we can be aware of what's out there. I was going to stop, but this, this question has come up three times, so I better ask it, So, uh, which is related in a way. How far back in the regulatory process do you need to go for new variant vaccines? So although the vector is identical, how much uh, of vetting of the new swapped essential antigen? Uh, is necessary. And that's, this has come up in different uh, questions. <laughs> okay, well, I, do, I don't think there's an entirely definite answer to that yet because it's something that regulators around the world are looking at and thinking about. But based on the, the flu strain change, what we would expect is that if the, the vector is the same and the manufacturing process is the same, and that is important that those are not changed, then it should be possible to conduct a phase one study and demonstrate that the safety is not changed, as we would expect, and that the um, 
neutralizing antibodies induced by the new variant vaccine are capable of neutralizing that variant virus. Um, and that is the uh, package of data that we would expect to be submitting to the regulators for their approval for a strain change. But as I say, that will um, require agreement by the regulators before that those details can be finalized. Well, so no further efficacy studies, a phase one. Okay. 